Welcome back into the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jed and Sap, presented by Full Press Coverage. I am going to do my best today to be a little bit more toned down, a little bit more docile. We don't have a lot of Celtics topics on the docket today, so I can take a deep breath, Sap. I can calm down, and I will allow you to speak today. How does that sound? That sounds good, and when we talk about our final four picks, I won't bring up Oregon, all right, because I know that will get you fired up as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll not go there. You probably will go there at some point, though. Stay away from my trigger words. Celtics, Ducks, Ainge, Rob Williams, Brad Stevens. If you stay away from those, you should be fine. That's true. Yeah, Marcus Smart, you know. Trump, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, we'll stay away from those words. Let me write those down. So yeah, those are trigger words for you. Tattoo them on your body so you know yes. permanently. What, what will... If you want to have a show where you talk, stay away from those topics. All right. Seth. That's that's I know the same thing for you. LeBron, Aaron Rodgers. Yep. Uh, I, who else? Uh, Scorsese, maybe I should. Scorsese, I yeah. Stuff. Roger Federer, Mario Lemieux, Barry Bonds, more than anyone. But luckily, we do a NBA podcast, so we pretty much only talk about LeBron. And that we point, agree so on Barry Bonds too. So yeah, you, you're a fan of his as well. So. That's so, good. Uh, yeah, we'll have, we'll have a lot more give and take today, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is good, though, because, you know, the trade di- deadline's approaching, Sap, and I don't want to be the only person trying to prognosticate uh, this deadline because I'm just assuming the Celtics are going to go out and get every star available. And so if you listen to me, you know, there'll be finals contenders in no time. Uh, but it does seem like there's a lot of conflicting actual reports on whether it's going to be a busy deadline or a very dull deadline. I've heard both, which kind of seems par for the course. There's a lot of lying going around this time mm-hmm. of year in uh, in basketball. GMs uh, who want to either send smoke signals or cover their tracks. Uh, let me start with asking you this then. Do you think it's going to be a busy deadline or a dull deadline? Probably a dull deadline. I mean, I'm trying to think of who the players are that are going to get moved. Most of them are big men, like Andre Drummond is one of those guys, Hassan Whiteside, and that would be a reach because Whiteside is someone who doesn't seem to be engaged all the time, but if he goes to the right situation, maybe he will be. I mean, he's playing in Sacramento. How motivated can he be playing for Sacramento? Um, You know, those are two guys that you think could certainly bring their talents and, and help a contending team, but there's so many teams somewhat in contention. I mean, we all agree that, you know, Lakers, Clippers in the West, Sixers and of course Brooklyn in the east with maybe Milwaukee and Phoenix and a few other teams on the periphery but then there's a lot of teams that are contending because the playoffs as I call them are extended to you know nine and ten in each yeah, conference so you do have stuff. you play in game so you, you technically have 20 of 30 teams that will you know can say they make the playoffs so maybe they think that one player could put them over the top but who is that player I mean I don't think anybody's going to move a major star like Bradley Beal is the name that always comes up. He's not going to be moved till no. the off season. Right. So let, let's take him I'm out of the sure equation. He's moved in general. I... They, may, they may just say, let's, you know, build around Bradley Beal and maybe they go after a free agent and, and try to become a contending team in Washington. So I, I don't see it being that active. It's the 25th of March. So we're a week away from that. Uh, it would seem to be that a few big guys might be available out there and it probably can end up going to the, Brooklyn Nets or the LA Lakers or one of the contending teams that makes the most sense. Well, that's the buyout market sort of thing with those bigger guys, right? right? Because the Nets and Lakers are pretty hard capped and have Mm -hmm. no real assets to trade because they're not trading their star players. Right. Uh, So if they're going to get somebody like, you know, like a white side or a drum and really the only mechanism available to them is is just sign them out. Right. So the, the couple of names I just, put together in terms of guys I could see getting moved Harrison Barnes, who's been bandied about for, you know, basically the entire season, the Kings are obviously mm-hmm. going nowhere. I could really see anybody on the Kings getting traded. So I shouldn't just say Harrison Barnes. I think buddy healed is available. If somebody wants mm-hmm. him, Marvin Bagley, they seem ready to give up on him though. He just got hurt again. So I don't know if that affects his trade value or ability to be traded really anybody on the Kings. You can just go ahead and say they could be traded. John Collins seems to have picked up a little bit more heat because I think that the, uh, the Hawks and him are at a complete impasse in terms of what they view his value as this offseason. He's a free agent. He wants a max contract. The Hawks don't seem to want to give him that. So I could see him being traded to they recoup some value for him before losing him outright in free agency. If they are unwilling to pay him, 
We talked about Andre Drummond. There's another guy who could be potentially bought out, though I have a sneaking suspicion that Dan Gilbert, the Cavaliers owner, doesn't want to do that because it would directly help out LeBron James. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think he would go to the Lakers. Gilbert obviously doesn't want to do anything to help LeBron out. Um, I put LaMarcus Aldridge down. Again, not really a player that's what he was, uh, but could probably help a contending team. If he plays, you know, limited minutes off of a bench, off the bench, could get bought out, could get traded. Uh, the biggest name I actually think that could potentially be traded is Kyle Lowry. And we talked a little bit about this last week. The Raptors are in sort of a no man's land situation. Kyle mm-hmm. Lowry is a free agent after the season. He's their best player in their franchise history. I think you would, you, you, I'd feel pretty comfortable saying that. Not the most talented player, but he's accomplished the most as a Raptor. Yeah, more than DeRozan, more than Vince Carter in a sense. And, of course, Kawhi is the greatest player in Raptors history, but he was there for one year. Right, yeah. So, I, you know, he's that, it's a tricky situation with Lowry because he means so much to the franchise mm-hmm. and to Toronto, though they're not even playing in Toronto this year. Um, <laughs> but he could really, really help a contender, and the, uh, and the Raptors are not that. And I'm not sure they want to resign him this offseason because I think they're going to go in a completely different direction. You know, he's he's at the towards the tail end of his career. Uh, and the Raptors are, I think, seemingly want to build around Pascal Siakam, maybe Chris Boucher, a couple of young guys that they have. Van Vliet, they signed last offseason for big money. So Lowry might be the odd man out there. And so he could certainly help a team. We talked about him on the Miami Heat, the Philadelphia 76ers. He's from Philly. A lot of teams would be interested in him if he is made available. And then I also uh, said the entire Orlando Magic franchise, that's that's up for trade too. So if you want somebody on the Magic, Vucevic, Aaron Gordon, um, Terrence Ross, whoever you want on the Magic. they're 20 year would be an a, yeah, a option as well. All, all available. Anybody on Orlando and pretty much anyone on Sacramento with the exception of De'Aaron Fox because that's the player yeah, that you exactly. build around yeah, if you're Sacramento. Yeah, these are all really viable options. And, and again, you kind of brought us back in, Jet, with – the trade deadline stuff because those are guys that get traded. I, I kind of jumped to the buyout market. Uh, maybe you're excited my, about the Lakers. That's what I'm excited is. about the Lakers. They couldn't trade for me. They couldn't afford me to come in and be their you know fat point guard. You know, which I'd fit in good with LeBron. We kind of look at the game the same way, except he's like you know really talented and I'm not. But yeah, those those are the guys I'm looking at. Whether it be Drummond, Javale McGee. The only problem is. Those two guys are on Cleveland, right? And as you said, Dan Gilbert does not want to help LeBron win a fifth title. Hassan Whiteside is the one that I would love to see end up with the Lakers because I think he's the most talented of those guys. But you've brought it up a million times. Not the most motivated guy unless he shows up in L.A. and LeBron motivates him and says he has a chance to win a championship. But uh, Vucevic – It worked for Dwight Howard last year, that same technique. Because I think LeBron can keep people focused for a year or two. Heck, he he had J.R. Smith focus for several years except when jr forgot you know what the score was uh, at the end of game one of the 2018 finals i'll never forgive him for that and probably <laughs> lebron won't either but uh, i think vucevic is, is an option right and and i'm sure as a celtic guy you would love to see that happen but i, I can't see it happening right depends how cheap it, they could get him for i mean i, I certainly don't yeah. think he's somebody that you you know send multiple first round picks for and young players for vucevic because it's all it's all a calculation, right? Can you get can this person put you over the top? Right. And I like Vucevic as a player. I think he'd probably play well in the Celtic system, but I don't think he extends their ceiling to going to the NBA finals. And so if he doesn't, then what's really the point of making that type of move? And would you move now? This is something I'm sure that when I ask you this, you're gonna fall out of your seat. Mm. Would you trade Robert Williams? In general or for Vucevic? For Vucevic, I mean, if that's part of the deal, you're getting someone you know can play, although all much older player. The guy was an all-star this year, right? I mean, he's yes. a legitimate player. Robert Williams, the last month, has looked like, you know, a future all-star player or at least an impact player, right? So maybe this is the time to trade him when his value's at its highest, unless they're just sold on him. And I, I think Mike Gorman was on a local radio station today said he wouldn't trade Robert Williams for, I forget who it was, like a, a legitimate stud in the league. I'm like, okay, this is typical Celtic stuff, right, where you just overrate all of your players. No, we can't possibly trade Robert Williams, and, and you know, even if we get back an all-star, because he's going to be better than Hakeem Olajuwon. So uh, that, that's where I think the Celtics – and I think they buy into Danny Ainge's MO, because that's kind of what Danny Ainge does, right? Falls in yes. love with his own players and won't move them. So 
Well, I don't I, think that uh, Brad Stevens is that way. I think he he does he dislikes Rob Williams. If anything, I told you that's one of my trigger words. Seth. <laughs> I know I shouldn't have said it yet. I'm sorry. And I already brought LeBron James up. Is going to you know fix all the Lakers' problems, which he normally does. So we'll have to we'll have to kind of regroup here, Jet. But, but would um, I trade him? Yes, I would for the right player. I the Celtics defense staff is so bad. That it really is. Rob, and Rob Williams is your best paint defender, and it's not close. Yeah. And so I, I, I think, you know, Vucevic is the better player right now. I'd be stupid to say otherwise, but I don't know that swapping Rob Williams out and bringing in Vucevic nets you any more wins than, than if you just keep the current roster, what? because I think the defense would take a hit and it's already bad. You're more of a defensive guy than I am. I just, I, oh, I like love teams defense. that yes, essentially outscore people. Now it's kind of interesting because the Lakers by far have the top rated defense in the NBA. Uh, and I think that's a reason why they can repeat because they are one team that legitimately plays defense. I don't think the Brooklyn Nets play defense. They don't. Uh, the, the Clippers at times play defense, but not as consistently as the Lakers. What the hell's gone wrong with the Celtics defense? Because, you know, you got Tatum and Brown are guys that should be good defenders. You got Marcus Smart, who was first team all NBA defense last year. You got Robert Williams as a, you know, a good rim protector. Like, what the hell has happened with the defense? Is it coaching? Is it lack of effort? And I know, I know we don't necessarily want to go down this rabbit hole as we're talking about trade deadline stuff, but that loss to Utah was just infuriating. I mean, Utah they gave really up 40 good. points in the fourth quarter. In the fourth quarter, <laughs> right. I mean, and Utah's damn good. They've got the best record in the league, and, and how they move the ball is so fun to watch compared to the Celtics who just run ISO constantly. And you're like, okay, Jason Tatum, we get it. You can dribble. You've got all the moves in the world, but – the other four guys are falling asleep, including me watching the game falling asleep because it's, it's, it's kind of a boring brand of basketball. But what the hell's happened with the Celtics defense? I think that, well, it's coaching certainly for one, and I think that more so it's that they just stopped listening to the coaching because mm-hmm. if you look at their defense last year, it was one of the better defenses in the right. league, and they didn't really lose much personnel this offseason outside of Gordon Hayward, who didn't play all that much last year, especially in the bubble. So – you have to look at it as either teams have completely figured out the Celtics defense, which I mean, I guess is possible, but it shouldn't, it's not football. It shouldn't matter. Like, you know, they've mm-hmm. out schemed you or they're just not putting in the effort or listening to the, the coaching anymore. It, it's, it, it's not something that should be, you know, very complicated to, to give you the answer. I'm sure the players know the answer, but it's not good, and, and they're constantly giving up 30-point quarters. They gave up a 40-point quarter last night, obviously, in the fourth. Uh, it, they, they have these lulls, and last night you saw it, and I talked about it in my post game, where they'll just like take four possessions in a row off mm-hmm. defensively. Like The Jazz, to start, I think it was the fourth quarter last night, had a wide-open three from uh, Clarkson, top of the key. That I mean, that's exactly what he wants to do. Then next possession, wide open corner three from George Niang. That's his spot. No one defended it. And then uh, Rudy Gobert sauntered down the lane and dunked it. And that was three which possessions ha- in a row. So that's which eight happens, points right there. Which happens when you make threes, right? Because then that opens up the entire floor for your big guys. But I don't right? think they scout it well. Like if you're a good three point, if you have good three point shooters who aren't necessarily like Niang or Ingles on the Jazz. Those guys have spots. They're good three-point mm-hmm. shooters from where they shoot. So you have to scout it and know that they're setting up in the corner. Don't leave them wide open in the corner. That's right. the only place they can hurt you from. They're not hurting you from the baseline. They're not hurting you from the top of the key. They're not hurting you in the paint. Go go defend that person where they want to shoot the ball. It's not yeah, that be- complicated. Because that's the worst team to leave wide open because right now the Jazz are shooting 40% from three, which is third best in the league. And they're making 18 threes per game, and they defend the three better than anyone. That's how the Jazz have accumulated the best record in basketball, by shooting the three better than just about anyone and certainly defending it better than anyone. I don't think that bodes well for the playoffs. But I just wanted to ask you as a defensive guy, as a Celtic guy, like what the hell is wrong? But, you know, if you want to get back to the trade deadline and the buyout market. just want to talk about Celtics Just talk about the Celtics. I know I I promised not to have those trigger words. We weren't going to talk about the Celtics, but I couldn't help myself. I saw that in the fourth quarter last night and said 40 points in one quarter. That's not good. But, you know. We'll see what they do with the trade deadline. I don't think they're going to use the trade exception until the offseason. And Danny Ainge has almost said as much, right? I mean, would you be shocked if they made a move? 
would I be shocked if they made a move? No, I wouldn't be shocked if they made a move. Well, he, hasn't, but, he hasn't made a move since 2015 when he acquired yeah, Isaiah Thomas. But I think that people are really pissed off right now. And that's, you know, when there's there's a uh, large uh, cadre of people calling you out and calling for your job, it does put a little bit more pressure on you. I, I, I think... He well, has Belichick to signal. Reacted, right, Bill Belichick. Yeah, I think he has to signal like to the fan base that available. he's at least trying to make the team better. Because, like last year, and this is what the most frustrating part for me is, is that they had an open window last year. They legitimately, the Celtics could have improved at the deadline to the point where mm-hmm. they could have made the NBA Finals. And I think given the Lakers a, a run for it, and maybe not have beaten them, but certainly have given them a run for it. I think they matched up pretty well with with the Lakers. Uh, but Ainge did nothing. He stood pat at the yep. deadline, even though everybody knew they needed bench help and they needed height. And those guys could have been had for, you know, what, what amounted to be, you know, the, the pick that got you Aaron Neesmith, or maybe not even that, maybe your own, uh, something that was less. And Danny Ainge chose to stand pat because he falls in love with his picks and his players. And, and so I do think that there's, there's a need for him to show, Hey, I've made a mistake these past couple of years not adding, and in a way that the Celtics had a kind of a window to the NBA Finals, and it it actively blocked them by not trying to get better. So I, I would hope he makes a move just to say that he's still paying attention and trying to do something, as opposed to just collecting his checks and doing radio hits. Yeah, th- there's no path this year either, unless the. Brooklyn Nets completely implode. No, none. Look, That's they're, why they're last winning. year was so frustrating, Seb. There's yeah, no path it, it this was, year. It was there for them, right? I mean, because, you know, Kawhi was already in the Western Conference. Durant and Kyrie were out. Uh, the 76ers, they were able to sweep in the first round. And then they beat Toronto in the second round. And Toronto Milwaukee team. got tossed. And, and Milwaukee got tossed. So you, you had the Miami Heat to beat with Jimmy Butler and a bunch of really good three-point shooters. And you couldn't do that because your defense really – sucked in that series and also your offense did because you couldn't adapt to a zone defense that Eric Spolter was running for the Miami Heat I don't think they could have touched the Lakers in the finals but it would have been fun to watch right Lakers Celtics in the finals probably would have won six games so it is it is frustrating there's no path this year I mean the Celtics you think are going to be one and done in the playoffs and and the, the more I watch some of the other teams in the Eastern Conference I'm kind of agreeing with you if they get the right matchup in the first round and say they're the five seed and Somehow it's Charlotte or someone like that. Maybe they can win a first round series. But what do they do after that? Get swept by Brooklyn, which might be more frustrating and embarrassing than actually just getting knocked out by somebody else. Right. Well, Seth, I tweeted this out last night. If you look at the current standings right now, this look at the teams that you're bunched in with Charlotte, who's ahead of you right now, Mm -hmm. uh, Atlanta, New York. All of those teams have 20 wins. The Bulls have 18 wins. Mm-hmm. And the Celtics have 20 wins. So that's yep. the teams you're grouped around right now. Now tell me Danny Ainge and Brad Stevens are doing a good job. I know the mm-hmm. players deserve blame too, but it's a lot easier to get rid of the coach or get rid of the GM than to completely overhaul every single person on the roster. And that's what I think that the Celtics media honks don't necessarily understand is that just because the players aren't playing at their, at the level they should be, it, it's, it's a player's league. You can, you can't just easily swap out the players. You can swap mm-hmm. out the coach or the general manager for somebody who has a different vision. The players deserve blame. They deserve equal blame, but it's you, you build the team around the players, not around the coach or the general manager. Danny Ainge is in his 18th year running the Boston Celtics. It's only three fewer years than Bill Belichick's been running the Boston Celtics. Brad Stevens is in his eighth Patriots. year. Patriots, yeah. Belichick should be running. What did I say? I actually Celtics? think he would do a very good job. <laughs> he would do a very good job. Yeah, I mean, he would, you know, uh, make, there's no sixth round in the NBA draft to find someone like Tom Brady. But yeah, Belichick's been running the Patriots now for 21 or 22 years. And Ainge is only three fewer years than Belichick. And yet, for some reason, Belichick gets criticized more than Ainge. Uh, even though Belichick has six rings and, and Ainge has one. Um, and Brad Stevens has been here eight years. I've, there's only a handful of coaches that have been coaching at their current spot in the NBA longer than Brad Stevens. I mean, it's Greg Popovich. There's, Eric Spolstra uh, is the only one who's tenured longer in the Eastern Conference, I believe. Right. So, I mean, at some Stevens. point, it's the old expression, you know, shit or get off the pot. Like, this yeah. is nice. You make the Eastern Conference finals. Uh, you know, you, you lose to LeBron James and 
Jeff Green was their second best player in that series. Um, you had game seven at home. You had a double digit lead in the third quarter. You couldn't hold on. And I don't hold that against them. You, you're losing to the greatest player of all time and back to back Eastern conference finals. I have no, you know, I'm not going to hold them responsible for that, but last year was really their opportunity. They should have beat Miami in the Eastern conference finals and, and they didn't, but, uh, I'll get you off the Celtics, though, because I don't want to get you too fired up. You, you said you've had a long I've day. I've done a good I, job. I've done a good you, job. You've been very good, yeah. Low key. I think we've, there's better things to talk about. But I think well, we... I, I mean, overall, Sap, the, the point is, in the roundabout way that we've come to it, is whoever is available at the trade deadline for the Celtics, the way the roster is currently constituted, they're not one player away from suddenly right. competing for a championship. Exactly. And I, I don't see any team that's one player away from competing for a championship. I think the contenders are who the contenders mm-hmm. are, right? Yeah. You could certainly bo- the, those teams though can certainly bolster their odds. Uh, maybe if I were to revise, I would say maybe the Bucks could be one player away from winning a championship, but they don't have the ammunition to go out and get that player. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah, you know, one, one player, I'm thinking of Harrison Barnes, who I think is wildly overrated. He, he won a championship with Golden State. He's good. But he, he's a solid, he's good. Good, veteran solid player. player, right? He can hit threes. He can play defense. Um, you know, he, he's just a really solid pro. Him on Phoenix might be something that would be interesting. I don't know if the yeah, money would work. I still don't think work. it's enough to put them over the to, over No, it the, still isn't. The top. It still isn't. So, no, because is, De- is Devin Booker the guy that's going to lead you to the promised land? And, and Chris Ball's at a different point in his career now. He, he's more of a facilitator, and he does that as well as anyone that we've seen in, in decades. But, yeah, they, they, even that wouldn't put them over the top. So I, I think you just look at the big guys. White side to the Lakers, if properly motivated, would be a home run for them. And, and drum It's an and, arms race amongst the, the teams that are already competing for it. That's what it is. That's exactly what it it's is. It's supplemental pieces. It's nobody like Andre Drummond, even though the rebounding numbers are eye-popping, for a team like the Nets or the Lakers or even the Clippers – he would end up being like a supplemental piece. You know, he's not exactly. going to be the focal point of that team. Nope. He's, he's not going to completely alter the DNA of that team. Uh, the, the Kyle Lowry thing to the heat, I think would be interesting just because that would make them suddenly an extremely difficult out. Uh, I still think that I would take the nets over the heat in that series, but if you got Lowry and you didn't have to give up, you know, a ton, maybe you give up Duncan Robinson and some picks uh, I think that the Heat would suddenly become everybody's least favorite team to play. Well, you'd have two a holes, which was, is a compliment, right? You have Kyle Lowry and Jimmy Butler, two dogs out there. But I also think, and they just got that, a Reza, by the way, too. So that's another yeah, defensive, another another tough guy, right? Yeah, tough. Sand I mean, they're already going to be a bitch of a team to eliminate, but because the they're Nets so well coached, are so good, so talented that it's it, they'll probably be able to overcome it, but. Uh, that's or Lowry, at, at least one other place for Lowry could be the Clippers. You know, he won a championship with Kawhi Leonard two years ago. They need a point guard. That would be an interesting spot as well. So Sixers we'll see what happens. Be interesting. I mean, he, yep. he's good. And he will elevate wherever he goes because he's just a really, really good player and mm-hmm. makes everybody around him better culturally. Yep. Uh, so that could be the guy. But there's been conflicting reports that, you know, the Raptors don't want to just give him up. So we'll see what happens. But uh, I I get the sense that it's you're certainly not going to see a superstar get traded. No, no. Uh, it, it, there's not going to be like James Harden who's going to be moved. So we'll see. And it's going to be impactful because you'll see maybe for the trades you don't see more than the trades you do see, because mm-hmm. then you'll see the buyout market. So that's a week away on the 25th. As you mentioned, Sap, we're going to be continuing to keep a very close eye on that. And obviously we'll react and give you our, uh, our thoughts on any trade or buyout that happens when it does happen. Uh, Teams that are in position right now, Sap, also happen to have some of the t- the MVP front runners. We talked about mm-hmm. the other day Joel Embiid's injury and how that might impact the uh, the the uh, the MVP race and putting guys like Jokic and LeBron maybe a little bit ahead of him, depending on how many games he missed. Because I saw Embiid as the clear front runner, but you made a good point, Sap. If he misses what seven games, nine games, he's already missed nine games this year, so that would put him at eighteen. Mm-hmm. Um, which in is, a 72 game schedule, which would knock him down to 54 games, which means a lot he misses of games tw- to miss in a, yeah. he misses 25% of the games, which is the equivalent of missing 20 in an 82 game schedule. I, I think that almost takes him out of the equation as, as great as he is. As I said, uh, in our last podcast that the last player to win an MVP playing only, you know, 70% of his team's games was Bill Walton 
1978. Yeah. And that's when the players voted and, and Walton was just an otherworldly type player. So he, he may have injured himself out of the race. And here's the thing about Joel Embiid yet. He's never played more than 64 games. Yeah, he's you know, not so a durable it, guy. I mean, he's just not a durable guy. As great as he is, and he man, is he as many I mean, bigs aren't. I mean, it's it's it sort of goes with the territory, right? I mean, even Shaq, especially later in his career, was not at all a durable guy. I know he wasn't in great shape, Sap, but you nope. take a pounding yep. being, you know, uh, not just because you're you're playing down low a lot, but because you're just a bigger person, so that your knees go wear on you. That's just how good your feet, especially the feet with big men, is a killer. If you get a that's foot why. Injury, that's why I've always said the three greatest big men in the history of the sport are Russell, Kareem, and Wilt. Not exactly earth-shattering to say that because they were all durable. They were all great athletes. They were all in phenomenal condition. Ruined Bill condition. Walton's career, the foot injury. Yeah, it did. Yeah, well, Bill Walton had some injuries, decided to become a vegetarian, which is not necessarily the best thing to do when you're seven one, you know, 270 pounds. Bill Walton would have been in that discussion. If Bill Walton had stayed healthy his entire career, the, the three great centers would be the four great centers. Because I always put... Moses Malone, Elijah Wan, and Shaq below those other three guys. Walton's the guy that talent-wise could have held his own against Russell, Kareem, or Will Chamberlain. That's yeah, how you know, talented I think Moses he was. Malone gets, look, go and do yourself a favor and look at the numbers. He kind of gets forgotten about and how unbelievably great he was. I mean, dominantly great. Just unbelievable player. Uh, um, really. Three MVPs, Jed. He took a Houston team that was 40-42 and 42 in the regular season – to the NBA Finals against the Celtics, they lost. No in one six talks games about it. Well, aesthetically, the least pleasing player you'll ever see. I mean, he was just talk about a guy that just worked his ass off. I don't even know who I could compare him to today. Um, he well, was, look at the numbers. I mean, they're just oh, unbelievable. In fact, talk about him. I'll pull them up real quick because I want to see. He was him. he was a guy who would regularly go out and score twenty seven and fifteen. You know, there was a point in basketball that I thought that Moses Malone was the best player in basketball because. Dr. J was the face of the league up until the early eighties and then bird and magic took it over. And then eventually it was, you know, Michael, but I think that the best player in basketball for about a three or four year period in the early eighties was Moses Malone. He won three MVPs. He won one in 79, I believe one in 83 and one in 82. He Kareem Abdul-Jabbar hated playing against him because the guy was just constant effort. I, I, you just, Picture Russell Westbrook. I mean, he wasn't the athlete Russell Westbrook is, but just picture a big man who played his ass off like Russell Westbrook. That was Moses Malone. He was always just, just would not give up. He was a phenomenal offensive rebounder, underrated passer. Really Looking good at defender. this too, look at that durable. I mean, he played. Oh, he was, an, he was great. He, 82, I, I, 82, 80, yep. 81, 78, 71, 79, yep. 70. I mean, just no, he durable. Was, he was just a basketball player. He died, you know. Uh, also played for 20 expected. years. 20 he year was just, career. He was, uh, he's one of those overlooked players. You're right. He, like it's always Shaq or Elijah Wan as like the next, you know, group of centers after the big three. And I'm like, nah, Moses Malone was better than those well, guys. Look at he these won- numbers. What's he got into the NBA set? 19 and 15, 24 yep. and 18, 25 yep. and 14, 28 and 15, 31 yep. and 14, 24 oh, no. and 15, 22 and 13. I mean, and it goes on and on. I mean, that is ridiculous. No, he was great. He was great. He's, in my opinion, the fourth greatest center in the history of sport ahead of Elijah one ahead of Shaq. And like I said, Bill Walton, he could wedge in there in terms of talent, but just, you know, he didn't play enough games. But, yeah, you know, uh, as far as the MVP this year, I, Embiid, I still have him in my top five, but – I think, you know, by the time he comes back, he may have missed close to 20 games. I can't mm. see him winning the MVP. Yeah, there's so tough. many other candidates, right? In a way, I almost seeing – we've talked about what uh, – at points we thought this was going to be such a heavy MVP award in terms of, like, the weight of it being, like, so competitive that whoever comes out of it really deserved it. But because the Lakers have dipped a bit with Anthony Davis out, I think that's taking a lot of the shine off LeBron's season – now Embiid's injured. I could see somebody kind of – it's unfair to say this, back their way into the MVP, but almost back their way into the MVP. Like, look at my guy who I told you the other day I have surging in the MVP race. Dame Lillard last night put right. up a 50-piece and hit the game-winning three free throws. I mean, what else does a guy have to do to an MVP other than consistently put up huge performances – and then hit a clutch basket to win the game. Well, the rest of his team is hurt. He had 50 points on 20 shots. 
That almost seems impossible. Like, what else it? does he have to do to, no, to be the I, MVP I, front runner? If you want to hear my top five, I'll, I'll do it in descending sure. order. Yeah. Uh, Nikola Jokic, I have at number five. I mean, he's averaging 27, 11, nearly nine assists per game. Uh, number four, I got James Harden, 25, 8, and 11. He's been the constant with the Nets, right? Because Kyrie went AWOL for a few weeks, and Durant's been out over a month. And through it all, James Harden's playing at a very high level. I have Embiid at number three still, but I think as this continues on, he's going to fall out of the top five. You know, someone like uh, Luka Doncic or Giannis can jump into the top five. Giannis's numbers aren't much different than they were a year ago or two years ago when he won back-to-back MVPs, but his team's not playing quite as well. So I've got Embiid at number three. I got LeBron at number two, uh, 26, 8, and 8. And the thing about LeBron, and, you know, I have to defend my guy. Yes. My, uh, you know, now that he owns 2% of the Red Sox, I may have to buy a Red Sox hat. Um, the thing about LeBron is they dipped when it was both Davis and Schroeder out. Since Schroeder's come back, they're playing a lot better. So I think that may help him. And, you know, he's continually just putting up ridiculous numbers, 26, 8, and 8, which is essentially what he's done for 18 years. And he did it in high school. That, his high school numbers were 27, 8, and 8. And then this year it's 26, 8, and 8. Yeah, no, it, it's know. crazy. But I look at the other stuff because, I mean, he's won it before. And obviously oh, when, sure. he was a, when he was a front runner, he's you know, it was when Anthony Davis was healthy. Yep. I look at things like uh, – his three point percentage is is terrible. His free throw percentage should no, be better. No, it's not terrible. It's not terrible. It's thirty eight percent from three, right? Thirty seven percent from three. That's not terrible. It's, it's, it's not but great. In the past, sorry, it's gone. It's been trending downwards. He's at thirty six right. He's at thirty six right now. Okay, um, but he's also number one in defensive win shares, and he, he's going to be in contention for defensive player of the year. So you you can't you know not give him credit for that because they do have the number one rated defense. And he's anchoring that defense, not Anthony Davis. I have Dan Lillard number one. He's averaging 30 and a half points per game and eight assists. Yeah. And again, he had, yeah. uh, last night he had 50 points on 20 shots and 10 assists and hit the game winning shots. I mean, it's like, 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 I don't know what more he can do to help that team. So I, I got Dame at number one. I, I'm, I agree with you on that, Jed. And I, I brought Dame up a couple weeks ago, as you did as well. Uh, it, again, he plays in Portland. Somehow people forget about him. You know, when you, if you ask fans, you know, who's better, him or Curry, that's a great debate. Who's better, him or Kyrie Irving, that's a great debate. I mean, he didn't even start the All-Star game. No. He, he may be the MVP. I mean, imagine a guy not starting in the All-Star game and then several months later being the league MVP. It doesn't happen like that. So I, I got Dame number one. I'm, I'm with you on that, especially as that Portland team continues to just battle. And, and right now they're a number six seed, but they're only a couple games out of being like number four. Well, I mean, we talk about the injuries for the for the Golden State Warriors and how well yeah. Steph Curry is, has managed to keep the team afloat. They're 20 and 20, currently sitting in the nine spot in the West. And Portland's had just as bad injury luck, basically, as, as that team, as the as the the Warriors. And they're 23 and 16 and in the sixth spot right now. Yeah. So uh, Lillard, like I said to you, Seth, like, what else do you kind of have to do to be deserving of an MVP? Like he said 30 points. He's shooting 45% from the floor. He's shooting 39% from three, 93% from the free throw line, eight assists a game, four and a half rebounds a game for someone who's not very big, and at 27.2 per. I, I just, it's like, again, what what defines MVP? Because if it's the player who's most, if you take the player off the team and he's the most important player to that team, Take Damian Lillard off the Blazers this season. They're the worst team in the league. Well, maybe not the worst team, but they're a lottery team. Without I, question, they're not a playoff contender. Yeah. With the, the amount of injuries they had, they've had. So taking yeah. Lillard off the team that's been currently, I'm not saying if McCollum was healthy. I'm saying what's been going on this year. Right. How many games has he won for them virtually single-handedly, Sap? And he's always hitting these huge shots. I mean, he's like the antithesis of Paul George, who can't hit a big shot. And this guy apparently can't miss a big shot no i got him number one we're in agreement on that one right now i, I do think that what's going to happen he's, he's is- the fourth most efficient player in the league if by the the per rankings uh, and lebron uh this may be surprising to you is, is 15th and i right, think that yeah. should should ding him personally yeah i mean those are next gen stats i guess so yeah I like these those. are all gonna weigh in yeah you like <laughs> those because it has lebron at 15 i'm looking for one that has a number one um well you know who's but- number seven sap Marcus Smart, probably. Nope, Rob Williams. 
Yeah, there you go, Rob Williams. Okay, so those those are stats we really want to weigh. No, in it today. is funny though because like look Williams at it, is eight slots ahead of LeBron James. <laughs> so those are the stats we want to use. But this is one is Jokic, two is Embiid, three is Giannis, Lillard, Zion, Kawhi, and then there's Rob Williams right ahead of yeah. Luka Doncic and Steph wow. Curry. So <laughs> it's like an IQ test or an SAT a SAT question, which does not belong. You know, well, they Rob all make Williams. a lot of sense up until you get to, to, to that. Rob Williams, your guy. But I think what's going to happen is LeBron's going to always be like number two on all these lists, and someone's going to be number one for a while. You know, it was Embiid, then it was Harden, now it's Dame, and then you know LeBron's there at number two. It's almost going to be like Joe Biden. You know, he got the nomination after just kind of outlasting everybody, and maybe that's going to be the case with LeBron and, and LeBron and Lillard have an advantage and they don't miss games. And I think that's something you got to weigh in in this equation. Dependability is very important in this MVP race. Yeah, and obviously for the teams, would if they miss games, they would lose those games. But like I said before, many times in the show for the Lakers, it doesn't really matter where they're seated for the Blazers. No. They, it really matters where they're seated and who yeah. they're playing. So Dame can't miss games. Like no. he, he actually cannot. Uh, LeBron, if he wanted to, could miss games. They could be the eight seed. I've said this before, and they'd be fine. Absolutely yeah, yeah. fine. Uh, which, I mean, he did this pretty effectively in Cleveland where he would take time off and Cleveland yeah. would dip in the standings, and it made no difference come come postseason. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that Lillard at one is, is an absolutely reasonable choice. I would put Jokic a little bit higher on my thing than, than you mm-hmm. did, and I do think Giannis is starting to creep in there. But uh, – I'm going to just keep saying that same refrain. What else do you have to do to win MVP other than what Dame Lillard is doing? (laughs) Just watch him every night. Every night they're in a close game. Every night everybody knows where the ball is going at the end of the game. Every night he hits a big shot or gets fouled and hits a big free throw. It's like watching David Ortiz in the postseason. It seems like you can't foul him either, Sepp, because he's a 94% free throw shooter. Right. Yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. No, he's my choice right now, without question. Yep, uh, as Sap is giving me the calm down sign. Yeah, you got to calm down. You get you get very excited there. You get very very excited. Is that another you know trigger word? I love I love Dame. He's my favorite non Celtic. He is, and he's the best rapper in the league too, right? Yeah, I think his rapping is slightly overrated. His game is underrated. His rapping slightly overrated. That's a good one. I like that. You have to explain. Someone who really knows the rap game very well. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Same. Same. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy it. I, I can't say I've listened to a new rap album in 15 years. That's but, all right. Uh, that's, that's a lot more recent I did see Nas me. just won a Grammy for the first time, though, and that's somebody yeah. I was listening to as a kid. So I'd say, oh, congratulations to Nas. Uh, there you go. <laughs> um, this weekend, though, Sap, we have college basketball. Yes. Uh, with some, maybe some future MVPs playing in the uh, – what is a – I guess a bubble in Indianapolis, if you want to call it. Yeah. Everybody's in Indianapolis, uh, except for the uh, IU Hoosiers, who didn't qualify for the tournament this year, uh, which I'm sure Brad is, is really next frustrating. Place, right? Yeah, Brad frustrating Stevens to my sister, home. who's an alumni, and Brad Stevens, who All loves the, the Hoosiers. But uh, yeah, everybody's in Indianapolis, except for the team uh, that is the most popular in the state of Indiana. And they are more <laughs> popular than the Pacers, by the way, the, the Hoosiers. Oh, without question. Absolutely. Uh, so, Sap. Let's not do the entire tournament. I don't want to hear who you have in oh, the you know, no. one versus no, no. 16 game. Do you have a definitive final four? Of course I do, Jet. You know me better than that. I've got show prep here. What do you, what do you time, base it on? I Colors of it. jerseys? Yes. No, I base <laughs> it on uh, listening to uh, Dick Vitale, oh, Skip yeah. Bayless, uh, Jay Billis, uh, Whoever I, I kind of dip in and watch some college Skip Bayless basketball. Does not watch college My basketball. Own... Give me a break. No, but he, <laughs> but you know, he, he, he's very good at making it sound like he watches college basketball. Yeah. I've got my final four and then I've got like one upset special in each region. So yep. uh, in the West, I'm going with Gonzaga undefeated. Um, they've got a roster, which I find interesting because Gonzaga is always constructed where they'll have like a really talented Freshman like Jalen Suggs, who I think is going to yes. be a stud in the NBA. I mean, he looks plays a little bit like Russell Westbrook, but a, maybe a little more under control. Uh, but then they all people to Russell Westbrook, cross poor Russell Westbrook. <laughs> yeah, Cam Newton's Russell Westbrook because of the fashion, all that stuff. But and, but they always build their team with you know that stud freshman. But then they'll also have like a sophomore, junior. So it's well constructed, undefeated. Can they be the first team since Indiana? In 1976, to go undefeated through the regular season and postseason, 
Larry Bird in Indiana State came close three years after that. 1979, of course, Kentucky back in 2015 was undefeated, lost in the final four to Duke. So I got Gonzaga representing the West. I like Alabama in the East. Mm -hmm. I think that's a team that's been playing really well. They're a number two seed. I've got Arkansas, a three seed coming out of the South. Uh, so I've got two SEC Former teams. Former champions. And there's, yes, back in 1995, two, I, I believe. Yeah, it was, in the, it was in the 90s. Yeah, I remember UCLA. After UNLV or before UNLV? UNLV was 90. Duke was 91, 92. Uh, 93. Arkansas was in there. Uh, yeah. I, I, Arkansas may have been 93. UCLA was in there. Uh, Kentucky won it with Patino and, and Antoine Walker. Um, and then in the Midwest, I've got Illinois. They're a one seed. And my championship game, I have Illinois over Gonzaga. So I'm going with okay. Illinois to win the whole thing. I'm going with the Big Ten, which I think has been the best conference. Yeah, but pretty couple, much everybody agrees on it that. Has the Big been, Ten's yeah. been pretty, pretty outside of Indiana. Uh. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Everybody's in. There's like nine teams from the Big Ten. How's that? Uh, I got some upset specials, uh, just one in each region. I've got in the West, 12 seeded. Uh, UCAL Santa Barbara over Creighton, which is the five seed. I got Georgetown upsetting Colorado, a 12 versus five in the East. Uh, another 12 Georgetown's versus high. five. Yeah. Patrick Ewing, uh, you know, doing a good job coaching there. I've got wins Winthrop. in the garden. Doesn't get recognized by security recognized. in the garden. Like how could you not know that's Patrick <laughs> Ewing? There's not a lot of seven foot guys walking around <laughs> who played 15 years for the Knicks. And, and many people in New York think the greatest Nick of all time. I mean, you can debate whether it's him or, you know, Walt Frazier, like you, you, you stop Patrick Ewing at, in Madison Square Garden and said, I'm sorry, sir, you can't. Who are you? Like, come on. Uh, I've got Winthrop over Villanova, a 12 over a 5. Maybe because I live in Winthrop, so I, I picked Winthrop to beat it's Villanova. Not the same. Not the same. It's school. not the same, really. It's not the same. <laughs> then there's a Belmont that's always in there but didn't make it this year. And then I've got Rutgers. Uh, this is an ode to Bill Belichick because he's always yeah. drafting <laughs> Rutgers players. Rutgers over Clemson, uh, 10 over 7 in the Midwest. But in the end, I like Illinois over Gonzaga. Okay. Uh, you know, it's hard to pick Gonzaga, right? Because every year it seems like it's their year. I mean, this has been historic. Like over the past 30 years, they've had a bunch of teams that are great tournament teams only to just fizzle out at some mm -hmm. point. Uh, I mean, they're one of the, the best programs in the country and it's kind of remarkable that they're not in the major conference. Mark mm -hmm. view is, is just a fantastic coach and has built a, I mean, a program that is perennially uh, in the top, one, two, or three seeds. In Absolutely. The, in the um, and this year, by my count, Sap, I have them with four NBA players on that team, which mm -hmm. typically uh, translates to tournament success when you yep. are talking about that much high-end talent. Uh, so I do have them in my final four as well. Uh, I also have uh, Alabama in my final four. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But I have Gonzaga beating them and going to the finals against uh, – my other final four teams are Baylor and Oklahoma mm -hmm. State. I went a little Ooh. bit chalky here. Uh, I, I, Oklahoma State could lose in the first round or win it all. And this is going to be something that I'm going to talk about in our, our next show because we're going to be talking about future faces of the NBA. Mm -hmm. I love Cade Cunningham, their yep. star freshman on Oklahoma State. Oh, man, is he good. And he is fun to watch play. So he, as far as he can take them, they'll go. He is a matchup nightmare for any because he's basically he's he's an NBA player already. If the, if there was no if there was no restriction on age, he would have gone straight to the pros uh, instead of played for a year at Oklahoma State. So that's why I have them going that far is because I just I think he's the best. He's the best draft. Prize. He's going one where, you know, whoever has the pick, he's going one. Mm -hmm. And I've seen him in big games this year, a couple of big games against some really good teams just take over. So I have them as a uh, four seed getting in the final four. It will mm -hmm. probably be wrong because they could easily lose in the first round too. Sometimes that happens, especially when you put all your hopes on a freshman. Uh, but I have uh, Baylor beating them and then Gonzaga beating uh, Baylor. I have that same uh, upset as you do with uh, UCSB. Is that who it is? Santa yeah, Barbara. Yeah, UCAL Santa the Barbara, yep. The, the Gauchos, I believe the they Gauchos. are. The Gauchos, yes. Uh uh, and then I have Maryland beating number seven, UConn. The 10 seven is not really an upset. Basically, those are the no. same teams. And I have Syracuse, an 11 seed, beating San Diego State, a six seed. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Oh, oh another good one, good Sam. For that. I have your final four team losing in the first round to Colgate. 
Arkansas. Which one is that? Arkansas, Arkansas to Colgate? To right. Colgate. Oh, yeah. I guess that's going to be a shootout because Arkansas can get up and down the court and so can Colgate. Colgate yeah, I know nothing about Colgate so. other than some no. people like them. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I think I brush my teeth with Colgate. That's about the only thing I really know about Colgate. But, yeah, I, I was – I was thinking of picking Oklahoma State because I've seen Cunningham play probably half a dozen times this year. He is sensational. He's ready-made NBA. He's going to step in next year and be a factor. I mean, I, I kind of hope draft he, this year. It's a good. Draft. It is a good draft. Him and and I really like Suggs a lot. Suggs, Suggs Mobley, Suggs, the kid from USC, is also absolutely. Excellent. Yep, Moses Moody, uh, I believe in Alabama, looks like a real player. And the thing about Suggs, he was offered multiple scholarships as a quarterback to like wow. Ohio State, Alabama. Uh, I've seen him make a few like full court passes that look like a quarterback making a pass. So yeah, he's I, a top I like five that lock, lock, he's top five top pick five. without question. Uh, you know, he's got the, he's got the NBA body. He's got the mind for the game, but Cunningham looks like a guy that could step right in and, and be a factor. I mean, if Minnesota could ever get Cunningham to, to go with Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Edwards, maybe they're building something there, or maybe they're just the Minnesota Timberwolves and they screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they we had, say that they about had, if they can only get Andrew Wiggins to get in there with Carl Anthony? Towns. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> well they, uh, they they've never recovered from having two shots at Steph Curry, right? Because they had the fifth and the sixth pick in that draft, and they took Ricky Rubio, who's had a nice career, and Johnny Flynn from Syracuse, two point guards. So they wanted to pick a point guard. They took those two guys. And didn't take Steph Curry, who went to Golden State at number seven. They've never recovered from that. No, no. I mean, it's tough to recover from not drafting an all-time great player, especially when you have two shots at it. And when you have two shots at it and you draft the same position twice. <laughs> and you still Yeah, tell the Portland Trailblazers about that. They, they passed Michael Jordan for, you know, Sam Bowie, and they passed yeah. on Kevin Durant for – Odin. So yeah, that one hurt. That one is a little bit more complex because of the injuries yeah. that face. But yes, obviously, in retrospect, that doesn't look good at all. That looks <laughs> not uh, good at very all. Poor. Although, I mean, everybody talks about it. it was a real debate between Durant and Odin. It wasn't a debate. Sure at was. the time. It was not a debate. Everybody said Odin was one. Yeah, no, it was because of the size. And back then, big men were still being drafted. Right. No one, one was and, seriously considering Durant at one. Anybody no. who says that da- there's this like urban legend that Danny Ainge, if he had the top pick that year would have taken Durant one. There's just no freaking way. Yeah. Greg, no, Greg Oden was doing photo shoots with Bill Russell. I remember right. the, the pack of the tops cards that year. It was the cover of it was Odin and Bill Russell next to each other. Wow. Yeah. So, no, I mean, Cause he was going to be the next Bill Russell. Yeah. It was, he was going one. The, so yep. anybody who says otherwise, it's it's not the same as the Sam Bowie thing, but it's no. still not still not great, not nope. great at all. Not so good yeah, at I think all. it should be a fun tournament. There's a lot of good players in it. Obviously, the best players as usual are freshmen. Uh, you mentioned Moses Moody from Arkansas. He's a freshman. Zaire Williams from Stanford. He's a freshman. Uh, Suggs obviously a freshman. Mobley a freshman. Kate Cunningham a freshman. Uh, you'll see a lot of really talented freshman players this year. Though mm-hmm. we're going to see. Some teams that uh, typically are making it did not. No Kentucky, no mm-hmm. Duke, uh, which is the first time Duke hasn't made it since the early 90s, I'm pretty sure. Right, yeah, first time in 25 years. Uh, pretty remarkable. Kentucky was piss poor all year long. Um, on Very unusual for them to, to be so bad. So it's a weird year, but uh, you, I think you'll see a, a, a good tournament, although it'll be a maybe an odd tournament without the – you know, regions with the bubble, sort of everybody playing in Indianapolis. So mm-hmm. far, everybody's arrived and they said no positive COVID tests. So whether you, if you believe that the tournament should go off without a hitch, uh, if you don't believe that we could be seeing a real mess of a tournament if, uh, if they're not keeping close eye on these college kids going out and, and partying. So we'll see. I do see that there was one slight hiccup already. They scheduled BYU for a game on Sunday. BYU cannot play on Sundays. Mm. Uh, and so they had to fix that. So hopefully that's the biggest mistake that they make. But I'm looking forward to it. I dearly missed it last year, Sap. Mm-hmm. It's such a fun event. Even if you don't know who the players are or the teams are, it's just really entertaining to see. these. There's so many last-second finishes and so many close games between teams that you have no idea where they're located versus teams that have 50,000 people enrolled in their school. And that's right. I mean that that David versus Goliath thing. That's where you, that's where it's the most fun is in the college basketball tournament because all it takes is one good game and or one bad game to knock off a team that looks like world beaters. 
Right, because Alabama is not losing in college football to some unknown. No. But it can happen in this tournament. Would never happen. Yep. I mean, the, the worst thing that happens to Alabama against an unknown team is they only win by 30 instead of 70. <laughs> yeah, so. and they don't cover the spread. Right. So I'm looking forward to it, Sap. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think any of those top guys will be headed to the Celtics anytime soon or the Lakers, but uh, maybe we'll enjoy seeing them on the uh, the Timberwolves, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. It's, or the or, scary, this is a scary thing, Sap, or the Warriors who have the Timberwolves pick top three protected. But if it's right. number four, they're going to get a damn good player there if the Timberwolves don't get a top three pick. Yeah. And then suddenly you have Curry, Wiseman, Thompson, a top four pick. Yep. Look out. And, and, there's, and then there's going to be five for a superstar. And there's going to be five legitimate players, I think, in this draft. Last year, not so much. Um, the draft wasn't as as top heavy or really as talented. Lamelo Ball's running away with rookie of the year. Yeah. So it's looking yeah. better though. Anthony Edwards is playing some better basketball sure. in Minnesota. I mean, it's not translating to wins, but he's playing better in Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, if they could get if they could get a top three pick, that would be a very talented team. Who the hell knows if they'll you know they've had talented teams before in Minnesota. And it hasn't meant much. So nope. so we'll see. Uh, so that's going to do it for for this show. Sap. Uh, any uh, any brackets that you're in? I didn't even ask. Or are you just doing no. it for fun? Or are you in? No, just doing it for fun. I, not, I'm a win, not, not a Winthrop uh, area bracket. No, there's nothing going on here. We're usually a few years behind the time. We're probably still, you know, analyzing the 2007 tournament, you know, from 14 years ago. But yeah. uh, no, no bracketology for me. I'm just going to sit back and dip in and dip out and enjoy it. Yeah, it will be fun. Uh, I am uh, hoping Oregon has a nice showing. I don't love their seeding. Uh, they have a really tough matchup in the second round should they get there against Iowa. Uh, I do think that they had a chance of winning it last year if they had a tournament because they had my guy Peyton Pritchard. But we'll see. I'll be rooting for them. I got Oregon socks special for the tournament, so I'll be wearing those all tournament long. So. There you go. Make sure you wash them in between games. No, absolutely not. Uh, so that, again, does it for today's show. Uh, this is the Pick and Roll NBA podcast, which is presented by Full Press Coverage. We are everywhere that podcasts are. And uh, we may be starting – I think I'm going to be starting putting these shows up on YouTube. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Sap made sure he wore his very handsome sweater today. I just wore a Star Wars shirt. Uh, so you'll see that if I do end up putting this on YouTube and in the future, we'll be putting, I think all of our shows up on YouTube, just making it easier for you guys to listen to us and to see our handsome faces. Uh, so yes. are you okay with that? Absolutely. All right. All right. I know. I mean, maybe you don't want people seeing your apartment. Maybe you're very private. I don't know. Well, I'm going to have to start working on better backgrounds. You know? Yeah. You have so no decorations at all. No I mean, I, I, I'm like a hundred feet from the Atlantic ocean. So maybe I can start doing it outside. Yes, that, that would be nice. Very scenic. Yeah. Could be loud, Very though. scenic. That's true, uh, too, yeah. All right, thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, be sure to give us a uh, you know, thumbs up if we do get these up on YouTube and subscribe. And also to uh, leave a comment. Always tell either me or Sap what you liked or did not like about the show. Uh, we are free to ignore your advice, but we'll take it sometimes. Uh, again, Pick and Roll NBA Podcast with Jed and Sap, presented by Full Press Coverage. See you later, everybody.